No. No. Mr. McConnell. No. Are there any senators in the chain chamber wishing to vote or wishing to change their vote? If not, on this vote, the yeas are 50 and the nays are 49. And the motion is not agreed. And three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn not having voted in the affirmative, the motion is not agreed to. Majority Leader? I enter a motion to reconsider the vote. Motion is entered. Yeah, I just want to call to the attention of my colleagues a uh, statement of the uh, a part of the statement of the White House Press Secretary tonight, uh, presumably on behalf of the administration, <clears throat> simply says, we will not negotiate the status of unlawful immigrants while Democrats hold our lawful citizens hostage over their reckless demands. That appropriately recommend, re represents the White House view of where we are. And Mr. President, what we've just witnessed on the floor was a cynical decision by Senate Democrats to shove aside millions of Americans for the sake of irresponsible political games. A government shutdown was 100% avoidable, completely avoidable. Now it is imminent, all because Senate Democrats chose to filibuster a non-controversial funding bill that contains nothing, not a thing they do not support. Nothing they do not support. Perhaps across the aisle, some of our Democratic colleagues are feeling proud of themselves. But what has their filibuster accomplished? What has it accomplished? The answer is simple. Their very own government shutdown. Shutdown effects on the American people will come as no surprise. All week, as we've sat on the floor and begged our colleagues to come to their senses, Senate Republicans have described exactly, exactly what this will mean. For America's men and women in uniform, shutting down the government means delayed pay. For the many thousands of civilian employees who support their missions, it means furloughs. And for the families of fallen heroes, it may well mean a freeze on survivor death benefits. For veterans who rely on our promise of care, shutting down the government means threatening their access to treatment. For so many Americans struggling with opioid addiction, the same is true. Thanks to the Democratic leader's decision to filibuster an extension of the state children's health insurance program, Low-income families will slip closer to losing health coverage for their kids. And in many states, this is an emergency. I'm having trouble understanding which one of these outcomes my Democratic colleagues could possibly be proud of. Which one of them? I think our friends on the other side took some bad advice. Really bad advice. I'd hate to have to be trying to explain this myself. They ignored the governors, including seven Democrats who wrote Congress begging us, begging us to extend <clears throat> S-CHIP for nine million children. They ignored the needs of millions of Americans who rely on the federal government for important services. They held all this hostage, all of it hostage, over the completely unrelated issue of illegal immigration. Republicans in the Senate have done all we can to continue the normal operations of the federal government and secure certainty for these S-CHIP kids. We could pass it tonight if we go to the president for signature. These kids would be okay. Well, we're going to continue to do all we can. We'll vote again so the American people knows who stands for them. And when our friends across the aisle remember who it is they actually represent, 
will be ready to come together in a bipartisan discussion that will be necessary to clean up all of this mess. We've all been having private conversations here on the floor. Almost everybody on both sides doesn't understand how we ended up here. Because most of this stuff we agree on. Well, there's only one reason we ended up here. The shoehorning of illegal immigration into this debate. Now, having said that, there is a lot of sympathy in this body for doing something about the DACA kids. It's not like nobody's interested in that. We've been talking about it for three months. But the one reason we are where we are is because we couldn't close out any of these other component parts because our friends on the other side said, you got to deal with this issue. This issue is the key to getting defense spending. This issue is the key to getting help for S-chip kids. And on and on and on. I think most of the American people believe that shutting down the government over this issue, which doesn't even ripen until March, is irresponsible. And I've just listed all of the people who are going to be adversely impacted by this action. So we're going to keep on voting. And the government may be heading into shutdown, but the Senate's not shutting down. And we're open to talk and to resolve this. I don't think it makes the institution look very responsible. American people should expect better from us than this. Democratic leader. Mr. President, very sadly, we are on the precipice of a government shutdown. The majority leader only just allowed us to vote on a continuing resolution that he knew lacked the votes long before this hour. It's not just Democrats who oppose this CR. Several Republicans did as well. All of today, Mr. President, we have endeavored to reach an agreement with President Trump and the Republicans that would have not only spared a government shutdown, but cemented an agreement on spending caps, including those for our military, the health care issues, disaster relief, and immigration issues. President Trump reached out to me today, this morning, to invite me to the White House to talk all of these issues over, and I accept it. We had a lengthy and substantive discussion. During the meeting, in exchange for strong DACA protections, I reluctantly put the border wall on the table for discussion. Even that was not enough to entice the President to finish the deal. Many Democrats don't want to go that far on the border. Many Republicans don't either. But we were willing to compromise with the President to get an agreement. In the room, it sounded like the President was open to accept it. This afternoon, in my heart, I thought we might have a deal tonight. That was how far we'd come. That's how positive our discussion felt. We had a good meeting. but. What has transpired since that meeting in the Oval Office is indicative of the entire tumultuous and chaotic process Republicans have engaged in in the negotiations thus far. Even though President Trump seemed to like an outline of a deal in the room, he did not press his party in Congress to accept it. Speaker Ryan and Leader McConnell, without the commitment of the President, would not agree to accept anything either. What happened to the President Trump, who asked us to come up with a deal and promised that he'd take heat for it? What happened to that President? He backed off at the first sign 
of pressure. We had the outline of a deal on caps. We had the outline of a deal on health care. We had the outline of a deal on immigration, the toughest issue. It was real. It was an honest-to-goodness breakthrough. We could have passed a short-term extension of funding so that we could cross the T's, dot the I's, and be done with it all. But the dynamic of the past few weeks, during which the congressional Republicans looked to the President for guidance and the President provided none, prevailed again today, unfortunately. The same chaos, the same disarray, the same division and discord on the Republican side that's been in the background of these negotiations for months, unfortunately, appears endemic. It is standing in the way of bipartisan solutions to all of the issues now before us. Every American knows the Republican Party controls the White House, the Senate, the House. It's their job to keep the government open. It's their job to work with us on a way to move things forward. But they didn't reach out to us once on this CR. No discussion, no debate, nothing at all. It was produced without an ounce of Democratic input and dropped on our laps. And meanwhile, they can't even get on the same page as a party. They control every branch of the legislative process, and it's their responsibility to govern. And here, they have failed. Several Republicans voted against the CR, as well as Democrats, for the same reason we voted against it. One of the most serious consequences of having continuing resolution after continuing resolution is the damage it does to our military. As the Pentagon spokesman said last night, another CR would be wasteful and destructive to our military. The Navy secretary said that because of CRs, the Navy has put $4 billion in the trash can, poured, poured lighter fluid on it, and burnt it. That's the Navy secretary, because what you have done. This is no way to conduct the nation's business. Republicans know it, Democrats know it. The American people know that this party is not capable of governing. So where do we go from here? I believe many of my Republican colleagues sincerely want to get a deal. I know their hearts are in the right place. I know they lament the fact that we now accept brinksmanship, where bipartisanship used to be. In the past, there was always discussions in these issue issues. Everyone knew in the Senate you needed both parties to work together. None of that happened here today. Now, all of this problem is because Republican leadership can't get to yes because President Trump refuses to. Mr. President, President Trump, if you are listening, I am urging you, please take yes for an answer. The way things went today, the way you turned from a bipartisan deal, it's almost as if you were rooting for a shutdown. And now we'll have one. And the blame should crash entirely on President Trump's shoulders. This will be called the Trump shutdown. This will be called the Trump shutdown because there is no one, no one, who deserves the blame for the position we find ourselves in more than President Trump. He walked away from two bipartisan deals, including one today in which I even put the border wall on the table. What will it take for President Trump to say yes and learn how to execute the rudiments of government. Tomorrow marks a year to the day President Trump took the oath of office on the Capitol steps. Unfortunately, a Trump shutdown would be a perfect encapsulation of the chaos
he's unleashed on our government. Instead of bringing us all together, he's pulled us apart. Instead of governing from the middle, he's outsourced his presidency to the extremes. Instead, in instead of living up to the great deal maker he marketed himself to be, he's been the single driving force in scuttling bipartisan deals in Congress. And now with this late hour, his behavior is on the verge of grinding our government to a halt, a Trump shutdown. Democrats will continue to strive for a bipartisan agreement on all of the outstanding issues. I know there are men and women of goodwill on the other side of the aisle who are just as upset as I am with the direction we're headed in. I plead with them to see reason and prevail upon their leaders, and most of all the President, to give us the space to work together, to let us do the job the American people sent us here to do. When President Trump decides he is finally ready to lead his party to a deal, Democrats will be ready, willing, and eager to clinch it. There is a path forward. We can reach it quickly. Tomorrow, the President and the four leaders should immediately sit down and finish this deal so the entire government can get back to work on Monday. Heal the floor. I commend the five Democrats who voted not to shut the government down. The new senator from Alabama during his campaign said it was important to fund the S-SHIP program before it ran out of money. And he listened to the seven Democratic governors who said, this is an emergency, we need help. So there were five courageous Democrats on the other side who stood up to this ridiculous argument that it made sense somehow to shut down the government over an illegal immigration issue that the vast majority of this body would like to do something about anyway. So I want to particularly commend the five Democrats who had the courage to stand up to this ridiculous strategy that put their whole party in an incredible predicament. Because as the White House just indicated, the President's not going to talk about the issue at all while the government shut down. He made it quite clear. He said, when Democrats start paying our armed forces and first responders, we'll reopen negotiations on immigration reform. So this particular strategy has eliminated the possibility of getting a signature on the thing they shut the government down over. Anybody explain to me this strategy? I'm perplexed. I wasn't first in my class, but I wasn't last either. How does this get them what they're looking for? Well, we'll continue to talk because when all the games stop, the issues are still there. Every single one of them are still there. The American people expect us to act like adults to get together and solve the problems. Now, I'll be offering an amendment to change the date to February the 8th. We'll unfortunately not be able to get that vote tonight, but I'll be subsequently asking for consent. But at some point here, we'll be voting on February the 8th, and that's the date that the senator from South Carolina, senior senator from South Carolina and I have been talking about, the Democratic leader and I have been talking about, which begins to move a little bit closer to where our friends on the other side said they wanted to be, but a reasonable period of time it takes into account the State of the Union, uh, party conferences, 
and just the amount of time it takes to actually write a bill once you have an agreement. I mean, you can't just reach an agreement and snap like your fingers and everything falls into place and you're ready to go. So a reasonable period to first agree and then write and get ready to pass this negotiated settlement that we've been working on for months, February 8th is a very reasonable time. And so I'm going to give, I hear there's sentiment for that on both sides of the aisle. I hope so at some point. We'll vote on that option. I can't get that vote tonight, but I'm going to ask consent to have that vote tonight. I move, Mr. President, to table the motion to refer. As for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. Mm. Mr. President. Majority Leader. <clears throat> As of further proceedings on the quorum call be dismissed with. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes it, we have order. Senate will be in order. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it adjourn until 12 noon uh, tomorrow, Saturday, January 20th. Further, that following the prayer and pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired. The Journal of Proceedings be approved to date. The time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. And morning business be closed. Finally, following leader remarks, the Senate resume consideration of the House message to accompany H.R. 195. Is there objection? Without objection. No further business come before the Senate. I ask to stand adjourned under the previous order. The Senate stands adjourned until 12 noon today. And the Senate tonight failed to approve a measure to extend government funding past the midnight deadline. As of now, the government is effectively shut down without a temporary funding measure in place. The Senate is expected to be back in session this weekend, in fact, tomorrow at noon.